One of the most mysterious pieces of lore from Adventure Time is the Mother Gum, an entity that gives birth to one of the most intriguing characters of this series. And what if I told you we actually have a lot more information about the Mother Gum that you might not know? Over the course of this video, I will dive into the mysteries of the Mother Gum, unpacking its lore and its significance throughout this series. So let's get started. But first, if you're new here or have seen my content before, please hit the subscribe button. If you like Adventure Time or just enjoy my content, hitting the subscribe button will be a huge support. Now, without any further ado, let's jump right into the fascinating lore of the mother gum. Let's start with the very first time we see the mother gum and work our way up from there. The very first time we see her is in the episode Simon and Marcy from season 5 episode 14. This is when we get a flashback to Marceline's early days with Simon as her protector. She falls ill and Simon is determined to find some chicken noodle soup for her to make her feel better. We need to get you some chicken soup. On his quest he spots what he thinks might be a place to get some chicken noodle soup. A food truck. Might be chicken soup inside there. That pink stuff? Yeah, the pink stuff he climbs on? That's the very first time we see the mother gum. How do we know that this pink goo is the mother gum? Because later on in the episode, after Simon has to resort to the crown to keep him and Marcy safe, a can of chicken noodle soup and a can opener drop to the ground. Who got the chicken noodle soup? The camera pans up and it's the mother gum. This time with a face who smiles at Simon after giving him the chicken noodle soup. I found chicken soup. You're gonna feel awesome in a moment. I'm just glad you're okay. From the very first interaction we see with the mother gum, it's a very positive interaction, which is something to note down. And I'll bring it up later as an explanation on how the mother gum even came to be. But let's move on. The next and the last time, well, maybe last time, we see the mother gum is in the season seven episode one titled Bonnie and Nettie. You know, this is the episode where Princess Bubblegum lost control of her kingdom after being outvoted by her citizens. <laughs> and lost to the King of U. Finn and Jake swore to protect the Candy Kingdom, so they had to stay with the King of U and be his servants. He finds a door labeled Extreme Danger and is too scared to open it, so he tasks Finn and Jake to explore it for him. Turns out, it's just a family of expired banana guards. I love you. I love you too. Hey, there's stairs back here. But they go deeper, and what they find is truly amazing. It's a candy dragon. Look. Well, what we now know to be Nettie. King of Wu only wants to profit off of Nettie, but Finn and Jake don't agree, so they go see Princess Bubblegum about it. The King of Wu doesn't care and still wants to profit off of Nettie. However, he scares Nettie, and Nettie flees the Candy Kingdom. Finn and Jake catch up to Princess Bubblegum, and after telling her, she remembers. <gasps> oh no, this is all my fault, Nettie and gives us the backstory of her, Nettie, and the mother gum. Strap in folks, this is where things start getting good. We finally get to see how Princess Bubblegum and Nettie were born in a flashback on their way back to Ooh. Bonnie is seen falling from the ceiling of an abandoned building housing the mother gum. Nettie falls next, but he lands on a stalagmite and, frightened and hurt, squirms out of the building and into the wilderness, coming across a tree in an open field and starts sucking its roots. Bonnie shows up and tries to comfort him with the butterfly, which only frightens him even more. She then hugs him and clicks her tongue, which causes a glow to emanate from both of them. The scene zooms out to show that this field is the same one where the future Candy Kingdom will be built. Meanwhile, in the present, Nettie stumbles around in the wilderness and hides at a cave. Bonnie tracks down Nettie to the cave using her bod rod, which is calibrated to their sister brother Bond. She goes in alone and manages to calm Nettie down and lure him to sleep. She then wraps him in a blanket and flies him back to his chamber in the Candy Castle. He wakes up and begins to suck root vitamins, restoring the flow of candy juice to the kingdom. This is the the last time we hear about the mother gum in the series itself. More on that later. This episode gives us a lot of important information that we need and can use to piece together a story for the mother gum, Princess Bubblegum and Nettie. The first one and most obvious one being that Nettie is the sole reason the Candy Kingdom is thriving and Nettie was born from the mother gum, meaning that the mother gum is the sole reason that the Candy Kingdom is thriving. Yes, Princess Bubblegum built up the kingdom from the ground up, but it's all centered around the tree in which Nettie resides. If it weren't for Nettie, or even if it weren't for the mother gum, the Candy Kingdom wouldn't even be a thing. Now, remember how I said that this was maybe the last time we see the mother gum? Well, I wasn't lying. We get a ton of lore and information about the mother gum in the Adventure Time Explore the Dungeon because I don't know video game. This came as a huge surprise to me, but this video game reveals pretty much exactly what happened to the mother gum. The video game reveals that Princess Bubblegum locked the mother gum away in the dungeon of her newly constructed kingdom to keep them safe. After, 
mother, she was born from the mother gun. 1,000 years later, and one day, several dangerous criminals suddenly escape from the Candy Kingdom's underground dungeons. So, Princess Bubblegum has her allies explore the dungeon to find out what's going on. Eventually, they discover that the mother gun, who has been locked up for centuries, has seeped into the structure of the dungeon and weakened the doors, allowing the prisoners to escape. The explorers find themselves forced to fight the mother gum, and after the battle, it is unable to remain bound as one entity. The mother gum destabilizes and turns into bubbles and floats away. The bubbles are yelling stuff like, as they drift away. Very sad. But isn't that crazy? All that time wondering about the mother gum when it's been in a game for over 10 years. You might be wondering though, is it canon? We know the comics aren't canon, so is this game canon? Surprisingly, it is. I did a lot of research for this video and it seems that people have agreed that this game is indeed canon. This also might be what the bubbles are in the intro when we fly by the Candy Kingdom. They aren't pink, but they could be a remembrance of the mother gum, blowing bubbles to remember PB's parents. Now you also might be asking, we now know the middle and end of the Mother Gum saga. What about the start? Unfortunately, we don't have any video games that reveal the lore this time. This is where we strap on our imagination caps and start speculating. But I think I might know, but then again, I might be wrong. So leave your comments about it. So if you remember way back to the start of the video where I say, from the very first interaction we see with the Mother Gum, it's a very positive interaction. Well, this is it. This time period is right after the whole mushroom conflict and the land is infested with oozers. These zombie-like creatures, very obviously bad that got mutated from the whole mushroom conflict. Now, I think the mother gum is just mutated like the oozers. After all, we see them coexisting in the same post-apocalyptic land of Oo. But this time, instead of standing for evil, like the oozers very obviously do, the mother gum stands for good and tries to balance out the oozers bad. Think back to the very first interaction we see with the mother gum. It's helping out Simon and Marcy by giving them chicken noodle soup. I don't think that that's just a random one-off thing to throw into this episode. I think the creators put that in for a reason, trying to show us that the mother gum started off as a mutation just like the oozers, but stood for good instead of evil. Although you could say that BB ended up being evil, but that's a whole other can of worms that I'm not gonna open today. And there you pretty much have it, the riveting tale of the mother gum, spanning from the cataclysmic post-mushroom conflict era through the rise of the Candy Kingdom, to its eventual dispersion into the ether of the Adventure Time universe. You've explored her initial appearances, dug into her cryptic appearances in the Adventure Time, explored the dungeon because I don't know video game, and even speculated about her mysterious origins in the implications of her actions. Now don't forget, the essence of the Mother Gum, although sometimes overshadowed, resonates deeply within the Adventure Time universe. She's not just the origin of one of the key characters, Princess Bubblegum, but an embodiment of a powerful force of good amidst the turbulence. It's these stories, the undercurrents beneath the main plot, that give a show like Adventure Time its rich, intricate world building and lasting appeal. Now we might have traced the narrative of the Mother Gum up to this point, but in the world of Adventure Time, every end could potentially be a new beginning. Whether it's in the form of subtle hints like the floating bubbles in the intro, or the prospects of uncovering more lore in the future content. Spirit of the Mother Gum seems destined to continue permeating the universe. So how's that for a tale of epic beginnings, heroic survival, and the never-ending cycle of stories? If you've got any theories or comments, I'd love to hear them. Did I get something wrong? Did I totally miss something? Please let me know. Let's keep this discussion going. And before you go, remember to smash the like button if you enjoyed our journey today. And if you're new here or haven't done so yet, please hit subscribe. It supports the channel and ensures you won't miss out on any future lore dives or episode analysis. If you enjoyed this video, you won't want to miss out on this video where I deep dive into the forgotten best episode of Adventure Time. What I uncover is truly fascinating and something you probably don't want to miss. But as always, my friends, stay adventurous. Ever wondered who Prismo's boss really is in Adventure Time? Now keep your pants on. It might just be you. But brace yourselves because I'm about to ruffle some feathers as we play the game of elimination with top contenders for Prismo's boss. Get ready for a shocker. Golb ain't the one calling the shots for Prismo. Sounds a little wild, right? But hear me out. Let's rewind to an Marvels got swiped by Golb, and our dude Magic Man tries to play Genie by wishing her back with Prismo's wish power. Prismo, being the cool guy he is, grants it, but hold up, instead of Marvels, all we get was a trash bin rocking a basketball hoop. Now check out Prismo's face. He's as flabbergasted as the rest of us. I mean, if Golb was truly the head honcho, wouldn't Prismo know all about his boss's mystical mojo? And yet, here he is, scratching his head in confusion. And then, like a rerun, he repeats the wish trick with Betty, after Simon strolls in hoping to wish her back to
to life. So why does Gulp get the boot from the boss's seat? Simply, because Prismo seems more puzzled by Gulp's powers than understanding. And that's just not how you'd react if Gulp was really the puppet master pulling Prismo's strings, right? Alright, now let's move on to the Cosmic Owl. Hold on to your socks, because this one's gonna be a doozy. Cosmic Owl isn't Prismo's boss either. Yep, you heard me right. There's this major buzz around the Cosmic Owl running the Prismo show, but there's this one mind-blowing scene that tells a different tell in my eyes. Let's dive headfirst into the Skyhooks Part 2 episode, the grand finale of the Elements miniseries. We've got Betty, our resident schemer, laying out her grandmaster plan of using the crown's power to time travel back and stop Simon from ever getting his hands on the darn crown. But wait, there's more. She's even dreaming of stopping the Mushroom War from happening. Cut the Prismo and the Cosmic Owl, just kicking back in the time room. But when Betty drops her plan, both of them look like they've seen a ghost, with the Cosmic Owl even dropping his drink. Total shocker, right? I'm betting my bottom dollar that Adventure Time is throwing us a curveball here, hinting that the Cosmic Owl and Prismo are playing the same game, level in terms of power and influence. Remember the first time we heard about Prismo's boss was back in the crossover episode, where Prismo drops a bomb to Finn and Jake that if they don't fix the mess, his boss is going to be super ticked. Fast forward to Prismo and the Cosmic Owl reacting to Betty's plan to stop the Mushroom War, their faces are just priceless. It's almost as if they're both fretting about the same boss, worried that they're in for a rough time, like in the crossover episode. But now we're left with a cliffhanger. If it ain't the Cosmic Owl, then who is Prismo's boss? I've got two wild ideas brewing in my noggin that might just make some sense. Let's dive headfirst into theory number one. Brace yourself, this one's wilder than my grandpa on a Vespa. Prismo's boss might just be us, the audience. Whoa, 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 whoa. Big leap. How did I piece that together? First, let's hop in our time machines and head back to the Jake the Dog episode. Just to fill you in and make sure we're all on the same page, let's get a quick refresher. So after the Lich masquerading as Billy, bamboozled Finn and Jake into opening a portal to the time room, he gets Prismo to grant him a wish. The total wipeout of life. Yikes. To tackle this, Finn and Jake had to throw in some wishes of their own. But plot twist. Finn's wish goes haywire. It lands him in a parallel universe where the mushroom bomb never went off. All thanks to Simon Petrikov freezing the bomb before it could hit the ground. Here's where it gets spicier than a jalapeno. Simon's skeleton is just hanging out under the frozen bomb, crown and all, like it's a day at the beach. Now Finn, in a wild move to save his fam from the Destiny gang, snatches the crown and goes on a freezing bolt shooting power trip. This, however, eventually does kick the bomb off. But here's where our Adventure Time creators made a wee bit of a goof. The scene where the bomb going off again after being frozen still shows Simon Petrikov sporting the crown. But hold up, that just can't be right, because Finn swiped it off him in the beginning. So the Adventure Time masterminds patched up a little hiccup by spinning a whole new episode. That episode? Crossover. Bet you didn't see that one coming. This episode, folks, is like a UFO sighting. It's the one and only time we hear about Prismo's elusive boss. The crossover episode swoops in to save the day, tidying up that tiny little snap move from the Jake the Dog episode. But picture this. Our dudes Finn and Jake have just wiped the floor with the Lich in the farm world dimension. But hold up. Farm world Finn still left clutching that crown, sending his brain on a wild goose chase. Seeing his doppelganger in distress, our main Finn turns to Prismo, asking, can you fix this mess? Because hey, that Finn is technically him. But stick with me here, because it gets weirder. Prismo pulls some timey-wimey stuff, he yoinks the crown from the farm world dimension, hits the rewind button on his timeline, plunks it back on Simon's head before the bomb goes off, and then wait, when the bomb does explode, it's scrubbed clean from farm world's timeline. And voila, just like that, they patched up the original animation blunder from the first episode, turning a mistake into a funky fresh backstory. How wild and unique is that? So, you're scratching your heads wondering, why in the land of Ooh would Prismo's boss flip out over this? Well, it all starts to click into place when you realize who Prismo's boss really is. None other than us, the diehard viewers, right? We're technically calling the shots because we're tuning in. We're soaking up every ounce of Adventure Time goodness. Now, think about it. If the show didn't have us, the loyal audience, well, it'd be like a tree falling in the forest with no one to hear it, right? Any goof, any mix-up wouldn't mean a thing because there'd be no one around to catch it. But because we're out here, all eyes on the show, any mistake, especially a whopper of an animation air could send the show's lore into a full-blown tailspin. That's enough to get us, the audience, the big bosses, a little hot under the collar. And that, folks, is why Prismo's freaking out more than a cat at a dog show. We're the lifeblood of Adventure Time. Without the loyal fan base, Adventure Time wouldn't be the smashing hit it is. Probably wouldn't have sailed through 10 epic seasons. You see, Prismo's pulling a sly one on us, busting down the fourth wall. He's got a vested interest in keeping us viewers hooked, so Adventure Time keeps on rolling. Because if the viewer count takes a nosedive, if less folks are tuning in, perceiving the show, it might just fade into oblivion, leaving Prismo and all the quirky 
risky citizens of Adventure Time in the lurch, non-existent. But maybe you don't quite agree with this theory, but no problem. I've got another ace up my sleeve that might just be the real deal. So brace yourself with this one. Prismo's boss could actually be the big bad cosmic imagination itself. How's that for my mender? Now let's take a crazy dive into this wild idea. So we know Prismo's sweating buckets over the farm world business because our boy Finn is hard at work building a portal to the multiverse. But here's the kicker. Finn's knowledge of the multiverse and the potential fallout of such a portal is about as thin as a wet tissue paper, and his fiddling around could end up wreaking havoc on the structure of all realities. Now this is where things get really trippy. Why would the total meltdown of these realities be such a big deal? We know Prismo's scared stiff about his boss laying the blame on him, hinting that these realities gotta stay in one piece. But why? This is where the cosmic imagination waltz in. This enigmatic force gets its very mojo from the perception of others. So if all these realities went poof, and no one's left to give the universe a thought, it would just disappear into non-existence. And who goes with it? Prismo, Finn, Jake, and all our favorite characters from Adventure Time. And maybe this is why Prismo slips in that vital line. And by proxy, y'all both will be in the dip too. He's not just fretting about getting canned or catching heat from his boss, it's about the survival of the entire tapestry of existence. Now it's a wild ride. The cosmic imagination, the big cheese that ties together and keeps all the realities chugging along based on what its inhabitants think and perceive, would need these perceptions to keep on shrugging. If these perceptions hit the skids, well, so does it, leading to a total wipeout of everything. So if you squint a little and maybe turn your head, Prismo's boss being the cosmic imagination starts to make as much sense as pineapple on pizza. Controversial, but some folks swear by it. Prismo's whole gig seems to be directly linked to the upkeep and survival of these realities. If these realities start teetering on the edge, it set off alarm bells for the cosmic imagination. That's a one-way ticket to danger down for Prismo and all our pals in the Adventure Time universe. So we uncovered who could be pulling Prismo's strings. Now, here's where things get saucy. We're gonna tie all this into the bigger picture of Adventure Time. Here's where our friend, the prize ball guardian, struts onto stage. Much like Prismo's boss, the prize ball guardian Guardian might seem like a simple big guy on the outside, but trust me, as a whole can of worms were about to open. You might be scratching your head thinking, prize ball guardian, is this some new form of cryptocurrency? No, this ginormous dude might just hold some big time insights that could flip the way we understand Adventure Time on its head. Got your curiosity peaked? Well, it should be. If today's big reveal about Prismo's boss blew your mind, wait till you get a load of what we've dug up on the prize ball guardian. So strap in, because we're about to plunge deeper into the rabbit hole. Oh boy, strap in folks because we're diving headfirst into one of the wildest enigmas of Adventure Time, the mind-boggling prize ball guardian. I mean seriously, what's its deal? Why are there candy folks snoozing inside? What's with the living quarters stashed in there? It's like an endless rabbit hole of unanswered questions. But hold your horses because today we're going to unravel this mystery. Before we start splashing around in the deep end, let's rewind and have a gander at the few rare moments where the prize ball guardian actually rocks up in the series. First time we catch a glimpse of this bad boy is in the episode Grable's 1000+. Where it's showing off as this souped up, tricked out version of the Gumball Guardians. And boy, is it not just standing guard, but also doubling as a mobile living quarters for the Candy Kingdom. This hunk has a boxy noggin packed with candy citizens, all cozy in prize containers. And that's how it scored its name Prize Ball Guardian. It's sky high, sports a dark pink getup, and even totes a boomerang slash blaster on its waist. Take note, it's always lone wolfing. It's just our Prize Ball Guardian who comes to snag Cubert, mistaking him for Starchy. And there ain't nobody else in sight. Tuck that little piece of information away for later, cause it's gonna be big. Also, did you catch that when Cuber scooped up and shuttled to the living area, they breezed past this indoor wreck area that's all dark and unused. It's another curveball thrown into this crazy mystery, folks. And that is pretty much all the prize ball guardian action we get in this episode. Other than the fact it goes kaboom, thanks to Cuber's grables going off like the 4th of July fireworks. Then, we get another peep of our guardian in the big ol' finale come along with me. The cameo's short, but sure me and Beth chirp up that the prize ball guardians back in town, which means they've caught sight of it before. Only this time, it's rocking up with a souped up banana guard who's packing a jetpack, a double dome, and a blaster. Now, remember that piece of information I told you to tuck away about our guardian not hanging with anybody else? Well, folks, this is where it pays off. It sets up a timeline. Why the heck is that pimped out banana guard there? Because after Cuber turned the prize ball guardian into fireworks show with his Grables, it needed some extra muscle. So Grables 1000 plus lands before the series grand finale come along with me 
on our future timeline. But hey, that's about all was served up in the actual series itself. Now it's high time we rolled up our sleeves and took a wild leap into some sweet, sweet speculation. Let the theorizing begin. Kicking off with the big fat question that's been looming over us like a giant elephant. Why are all the candy peeps holed up inside the prize ball guardian? And where the heck is Princess Bubblegum? Well, strap in folks, because I reckon I've got answer to these head scratchers. First up, where's our gal Princess Bubblegum? What if I told you that we actually catch sight of her in the snazzy new intro sequence of the grand finale come along with me? No kidding, she's right there, front and center in the very first moments. Did you catch it? That's right. Those are her bubblegum pink mitts locked up behind those icy bars. But how can I be so confident? Well, the brains behind the show themselves have let slip that every elemental gets a shout out in the new intro sequence. And sure enough, we catch sight of each and every elemental in the intro. Patient St. Pim's right there at the very start, still in deep freeze. We see the new fire and slime elementals squaring off, and the counter lump elemental makes an appearance too. But guess who we're missing? The candy elemental, which means those pink hands we spot at the start have got to belong to Princess Bubblegum. Bingo! Next up, we see someone's on the hunt for her. And who's this mystery someone, you ask? You guessed it, folks. It's our gal, Marceline. Looks like Marceline and Princess Bubblegum are still kicking it a cool thousand years later, which totally adds up. But hold up. How can we be so sure that's Marceline? Well, buckle up, because here's the scoop. First, the thing that this person's riding is none other than the duck rock that popped up for the first and only time in the season one's Evicted episode. You know who else made their debut in that same episode? Bingo! Marceline. It's wildly strange that this minor character gets a callback in the finale's intro of all things. Second, if you hit pause on the intro when the mysterious figure breezes by, you'll spot that the telescope they're peeping through is engraved with two letters, an M sitting on top of an A. Now who in this wild and wacky world could possibly still be around and just so happens to have the initials M and A? Nailed it! Our immortal lady, Marceline Abadir. Third, and finally, you'll notice that this person's all wrapped up in a baggy coat, snow pants, and mittens from top to toe. That's a getup only a vampire would need to rock out in the sunshine, aka our girl Marceline. Also, the red boots that she's wearing is something that Marceline also wears in her debut episode Evicted. So if Princess Bubblegum and Marceline are still very much alive and kicking, why is her kingdom all kinds of messed up? And why the heck has she stashed all her subjects inside the prize ball guardian, presumably in some sort of cryostasis state? Well, honestly, it's not as wacky as you might think. In fact, we've seen this theme popping up again and again in Princess Bubblegum's life, that overwhelming feeling of not being in control. And the episode Varmints shines a big old spotlight on this. In this Adventure Time episode, we see Princess Bubblegum and Marceline team up to take down these pesky creatures known as varmints that are causing a whole load of trouble for PB's new digs, a humble pumpkin patch. But the juicy center of this episode is PB's emotional meltdown. Feeling the sheer weight of everything she's lost, she pours her heart out to Marceline, confessing how her diehard dedication to her kingdom led to her losing it all, even driving away her nearest and dearest. This emotional outpouring is a rare moment for PB and gives us a peek into the deeper layers of her character. She's wrestling with the loss of her kingdom and her struggle to balance her duty and her personal life. This emotional heart-to-heart -heart is a pivotal moment for PB. She doesn't just acknowledge her losses, but she starts to see the lessons she can learn from them. This opens the door for her relationship with Marceline to spark back to life, marking a mega moment of growth for both of these characters. I reckon that Princess Bubblegum, tucking her candy citizens away inside the prize ball guardian, was her way of finally nailing that tricky balance between her relationships and her royal duties. I'm betting those living quarters we see are where PB and Marceline are living it up, while also giving PB control over all her candy citizens. Because even though the living space is dark, it doesn't really look abandoned. In fact, there are still books scattered around the room. I've got a hunch that this was PB's master plan to finally get a handle on her kingdom, while also keeping her bond with Marceline going strong. So we've been doing some noggin scratching, and we reckon that Princess Bubblegum might have used the prize ball guardian as a safety net for her kingdom. But there's a big old question still hanging in the air. What was the tipping point? Let's swivel our attention to a major game changer. The Ice Crown. Yeah, you know the one. That ancient doodad that turned the plain old Simon Petrikoff into the wacky Ice King. This ain't just some trinket. It's a force that has shaped the entire Adventure Time saga. Could the Ice Crown had set off this chain of events that led Princess Bubblegum to make her drastic decision? What impact did it have on Ooh's future timeline? Alright folks, let's get our adventure boots on. We're about to take a deep dive into how the Ice Crown changed Adventure Time's history forever. Brace yourself as we unearth the ferocity story of this magical item and its effects on the land of Ooh. We've got more mysteries to crack open, so stick around. But as always, stay adventurous. Nice. I love this classic looking sword for Finn. Surely he sticks with the sword for the entire series and doesn't switch it up at all, right?
Oh boy, let's talk about it. Our epic journey begins with Finn's first weapon of choice, the Golden Sword of Battle, also known as Scarlet. This battle-hardened blade has seen its fair share of action. It's dented, chipped, and dirty, giving it a rugged charm that matches Finn's adventurous spirit. Its hilt is black, adorned with worn leather grip straps, and a red gemstone that shines like a beacon of courage in the pommel. In the Business Time episode, the businessmen, after the perfectionists, take it upon themselves to polish and sharpen the sword, restoring it to its former glory. It's a sight to behold, isn't it? But its time in the limelight is cut short in the real you, when the sword, now four-dimensional, after passing through the bubble creator, causes an explosion and gets lost in the cotton candy forest. This marks the end of Scarlet's run as Finn's trusty weapon, and leaves Finn without a sword until the mystery trait episode. During the Scarlet Sword era, Finn uses a plethora of swords that don't see the light of day, or are just one-off appearances, but I feel like they deserve a little love. In the episode, it came from the night sphere. Finn picks up the Sword of the dead from the grasslands. Wielding the sword, he confronts Marceline's father, Hunson Abadie, who's using his gullet to trap the souls of U. In an epic battle, Finn uses the sword of the dead to slice open the pods in Abadir's gullet, freeing the imprisoned souls. Amid the chaos and reciting the incantation to open a portal to the nidosphere, Finn drops the sword. Despite its brief appearance, the sword of the dead proves instrumental in Finn's quest. In an episode titled Slow Love, a different sword makes its appearance, dubbed the Aromatherapy Sword. It boasts a pink jewel and a hilt pointed on both ends. Finn is never seen wielding the sword in battle, but it proves its might by effortlessly slicing his bed in half. This pink jewel is more than just a decoration. It is a scented oil diffuser, capable of stunning opponents. A sword of this sort reveals just how diverse and unexpected the world of Adventure Time can be. But now, with the golden sword lost in the cotton candy forest, Finn needed a new weapon to continue his adventures, and the universe delivered just in time. In the suspense-filled Mystery Train episode, Finn stumbles upon his next trusty companion, the Root Sword. So named for its unique, spiraling handle that resembles intertwined roots, this sword isn't just visually striking, it packs a punch too. Right off the bat, Finn puts it to good use against the Conductor. This new weapon also proves its worth against the monster in Belly of the Beast and even the Ice King in Mortal Recoil. But the Root Sword isn't just for battling foes. Finn stores it in a makeshift pocket on his backpack, keeping it close at hand for whatever dangers might lie ahead. And it's not just practical, it's a sight to behold. The blade is a slightly pinkish silver tone, double-sided and well-maintained, save for a small chip that's a testament to its use in battle. From root-like hilts, we journey into a darker realm with our next sword, the Demon Blood Sword, uncovered in a dungeon left behind by Finn's father, Joshua. This weapon has a story as fascinating as its name suggests. The Demon Blood Sword first graces our screens in Dad's dungeon, where Finn and Jake venture deep into their father's labyrinth dungeon. At the end of their pearliest journey, Finn discovers the sword encased in stone and, with a mighty effort, frees it. He immediately puts it to use, slaying the final monster of the dungeon. The Demon Blood Sword, or simply the Demon Sword, holds a special place in Finn and Jake's family history. It was owned by their father, Joshua, and was the grand prize at the end of Joshua's dungeon. We see Finn and Jake undertake this pearliest journey in the episode Dad's Dungeon. Joshua forged this remarkable weapon out of demon blood, a fact he shared in a holographic video for his sons. But this sword has a twist. It's infused with demon blood, causing the demon Kioth to make sporadic appearances pleading for the return of his blood. Banishing Kioth is a simple task, though with the spell Kioth Rama Pancake written just behind the handle's wrapper. I may have just summoned Kioth, I don't know. The blood demon sword has proven its metal time and again. In the episode Return to the Nidosphere, it withstands Marceline's blood mist cloud blasts, and in Vault of Bones, it even shows immunity to fire. Finn uses it heroically, saving friends and vanquishing foes. Sadly, the demon blood sword meets a tragic end in play day, when Finn breaks it and releases the captive demon blood. But not all hope is lost. In the pit, Finn tricks Kioth with a clever replica of the demon blood sword, made from frozen grape juice and blessed by Shelby, leading to Kioth's demise. From swords forged in demon blood, we now turn to the realm of the mystic and organic. In the episode Blade of Grass, Finn replaces the fallen demon sword with a new, unique weapon, the Grass Sword. For a mere three dollars, Finn becomes the owner of the Grass Sword, purchased from the Grassy Wizard. But this sword, like its predecessor, holds a secret curse. It starts following Finn around, attempting to bind to its body, an eerie trait that unnerves our hero. But Finn, ever the adventurer, doesn't shy away. He accepts the curse, and in doing so, gains greater control over the Grass Sword's abilities. It's more than just a sword.
sword. It becomes a part of him, literally. In a heart-stopping moment at the Citadel, the Grass Sword makes the ultimate sacrifice to save Finn, resulting in the loss of his right arm. But life finds a way. In Breezy, Finn's arm grows back, revealing a new grass arm underneath his skin, possessing the same powers as the Grass Sword. In a shocking turn of events, the Grass Sword takes control over the Finn Sword, giving birth to the character of Fern. I already know what you're saying. The Finn Sword? We haven't covered that yet. Well, that's next up. So let's take a step back and look at a sword that briefly overlapped with the Grass Sword. Acquired in the episode Is That You, let's unveil the Finn Sword. Replacing the Grass Sword, at least for a while, the Finn Sword is a fascinating artifact. This sword is born when Finn takes a step back in time to save his buddy Prismo. Containing the spirit of his own alternate version, the Finn Sword doubles Finn's physical attributes, making him even more formidable in battle. And this isn't just for show. In the Dentist episode, we see the Finn Sword effortlessly slicing through giant worms, proving its sharpness and durability. But alas, the Finn Sword and the Grass Sword were destined to become one, resulting in the creation of Fern. Yet even in destruction, the Finn Sword lives on. After Fern's demise in Come Along With Me, his remains transform into a seed in the shape of the Finn Sword. Planted by Finn and Jake, this seed sprouts into a new tree with a remade Finn Sword at its very top. Many years later, Shermie and Beth discover the sword, a silent testament to Finn's legacy. Now let's dive in to Finn's next weapon of choice, a more modest but equally effective blade, amply named the Small Sword. Finn first wields the Small Sword in the episode Do Not Harm, using it in an attempt to wake Susan from her coma. This blade bears a striking resemblance to Radaval's sword, indicating its rapier-like design. The Small Sword features a remarkably thin blade, designed for precision stabs, but capable of delivering powerful slashes when needed. After Fern's formation, Finn had to part ways with the Grass Sword and Finn Sword, leaving him to adopt this compact warrior. Finn's consistent use of the Small Sword in subsequent episodes like Elements suggests a new preference. The Small Sword even gets a moment of glory in the hands of Sweet Pea, used to annihilate the Farm World Lich's hand. However, all good things must come to an end, and the Small Sword is no exception. In a divisive battle with Grumbo, the Small Sword suffers irreparable damage. From the Grand Demon Sword to the Humble Small Sword, Finn's story shows us that size doesn't determine effectiveness. And with that, I'm eager to unveil the next sword in Finn's journey. Last, but certainly not least, let's explore the dark and captivating world of the Night Sword. Crafted by the adept Peppermint Butler in the Marcy and Hudson episode, the Night Sword is gifted to Finn as a safeguard against Princess Bubblegum's family. This isn't your everyday blade, however. The Night Sword brims with potent dark magic straight from the Nidosphere. This exceptional blade is far more than meets the eye. Not only does it boast incredible durability, but it also has the ability to shackle and neutralize the powers of other beings. But that's not all. The Night Sword harbors a demonic eyeball and compass within it, further setting it apart from the rest. And the Night Sword doesn't just fade away. A millennium into the future, we find it in the mighty hands of a giant bearded Sweet Pea. We also spot a gray version of this sword earlier, subtly foreshadowed in the background cameo of the Treehouse. From the humble beginnings with the Scarlet Sword to the potent dark magic of the Night Sword, Finn's journey is a testament to resilience, adaptability, and the unending pursuit of justice. Every sword tells a story, a reflection of Finn at different points in his life, reminding us that it's not the weapon, but the wield that truly matters. I hope you all like this video. Thank you all so much for the support recently. I don't want to get all emotional with you all, but this has truly been my dream for such a long time, and I'm so happy that I have a community of people that love talking about and discussing Adventure Time, just like I do. And truly, I wouldn't be here without you all. So thank you all so much from the bottom of my heart. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. It helps so much. But as always, stay adventurous. Finn's future is revealed in the Distant Lands episode Subsidian and Together Again. And it's very tragic, but that begs the question, how did Finn get here? Well, it is confirmed that the episode Obsidian only takes place a few years after the finale. Come along with me. But we also wanted to keep it sort of about them now. So it's like what yeah. their relationship would be like a couple years down the road. And to keep a little context, Come Along With Me shows that PB and the Kin Kingdom are getting ready to go to war with Gambaldia, who was made by PB's relatives. Nobody really wants them to go back to war, so Finn ends up stopping. Just as everything seemed back to normal, Gulb arrives. After the whole showdown, Betty fuses with Gulb and leaves, therefore saving the land of Ood. After that, we get a nice cinematic showing all the residents of Ood going back to their normal lives. The one we really want to point out, however, is when Finn and Jake are lying on the beach. Then, out of nowhere, the humans from Hub Island make their voyage back to the land of Ood, including Finn's mom Minerva. 
Now, this is the last time we see Finn before his big reveal in Obsidian. So what happened? Better answer this question, let's first detail Finn's appearance in Obsidian. After the dust had settled in the Glass Kingdom, Simon appears late to the party with a group of familiar and new faces, including the Banana Guards, Bronwyn, and most notably, Finn. Finn appears as a grown-up now, taller, matured, facial hair, reflecting the years that have passed since we last saw him in Come Along With Me. Finn, along with Simon, Bronwyn, and the Banana Guards, joins in the ensuing celebration at the glass kingdom you might have noticed that i didn't mention finn's new tattoo of jake across his chest well while we're on the subject of making a mark why not leave your own by hitting that subscribe button no ink required now about this intriguing tattoo it's the first clue that could point us in the direction as to what happened to finn during the period between come along with me and obsidian you're not gonna like this but jake had died during this time or at least the creators are pretty heavily pointing at. Now, why do I say this? Well, I think Uncivilized Elk said it best. Jake is dead. I think that after Jake passed, Finn got this tattoo to honor the memory of his brother. Those flowers around Jake are forget-me-nots, and for me personally, that was all I needed to know. Jake's influence on Finn's life was monumental, and I know Finn would look back at that with utmost happiness. You're a beautiful flower and I love to watch you grow. I like to believe that he's pretty spot on with this. The death of a close friend, particularly someone as significant as Jake was to Finn, would have undoubtedly left a profound impact on him. Finn probably had to navigate through grief and perhaps even a sense of loneliness after losing his best friend and brother. In the aftermath of Jake's suspected passing, I reckon Finn would have sought comfort among those who knew Jake best. That's probably where Bronwyn comes in. Considering the not so rosy relationships Jake had with his kids, they might not have been Finn's first choice. I'm gonna be frank here. Your son's a real-time jingle blaster. But, as we all know, Bronwyn and Jake had a pretty good relationship. Their relationship was forged in the Wheels episode, and although their relationship was a bit rocky at the start, it ended amazingly, making Bronwyn the perfect person for Finn to connect with. In the face of grief, they would have been able to lean on each other, find comfort in shared memories, and navigate their sorrow together. I believe the presence of Bronwyn in Obsidian is a hint towards this. This shared journey brings us to to consider Finn's emotional state. In Obsidian, Finn appears to be content, not brimming with happiness, but also not brimming with sadness, but exhibiting a sense of contentment and maturity. That man's towel just blew off. My bad. Eh. This tranquility embodied in the tattoo of Jake and Finn's overall composed demeanor suggests Finn has gone through the stages of grief and has reached a point of acceptance. Now, don't get me wrong, this does not mean he's over the loss of Jake, in fact far from it, but rather he's learned to carry that loss, to hold space for the sadness while also making room for joy, growth, and new experiences, just as Jake would want him to. From this vantage point, we can see his contentment might also signify the strength of the relationships he's built since Jake's past. His bond with Bronwyn, for instance, likely provides a sense of camaraderie and mutual understanding that's both comforting and healing. All of this paints a picture of Finn not just surviving in the wake of tragedy, but finding a way to thrive. He's taken the raw deal life handed him and grown from it, finding peace in his journey and the circumstances of his life. In other words, Finn has become the embodiment of resilience between the time of Come Along With Me and Obsidian. But like the many layers of an onion, the narrative unfolds to reveal even more intricacies. In the opening sequence of Come Along With Me, we spot a grave that looks like are marked Finn and Jermaine. No mention of Jake. This cast a shadow of doubt over the belief that Jake died before Finn. Is this just a simple oversight or a subtle clue that the story might have played out different? Well actually, I believe it's a lot more simple than you might think. And I think Jake still died before Finn did. Remember back to the finale, Come Along With Me, after Shermie and Beth find Finn's old prosthetic arm, they take it to the King of Wu, which is now Bimo. After they ask Bimo who this arm belonged to, Bimo says, Yeah, it belonged to my best friend, Fred. Fred! No, not Fred. His name was Phil. 
Can you see where I'm getting at? Bimo outlived both Finn and Jake and likely made those graves for both of them. And as we see in the finale, Bimo often forgets Finn and Jake's names, or at least Finn's name, which is kind of sad, but that could explain why it looks like it says Finn and Jermaine. Bimo had simply just messed up the name of Jake, or even mixed up Jake with his brother Jermaine. Not to mention, Bimo is already an unreliable storyteller and very imaginative. There are so many things pointing to the fact that Bimo probably just forgot Jake's name, or mixed him up with Jermaine. With this in mind, it takes us to speculate Finn's post-Jake life and what happened to him further into the future. A bigger revelation coming from the Distant Lands episode Together Again. Little spoiler warning if you haven't seen the episode yet, but Finn's appearance in Together Again is a rather startling contrast to his previous content demeanor in Obsidian. Decades have passed and we see an aged Finn in a state of vivid hallucination, revisiting a reimagined narrative from his pre years, filled with a mix of beloved characters and bizarre circumstances, including a dramatic, guilt-ridden moment where Jake melts into a grave marked R.I.P. Jake, a clear sign of Finn's unresolved feelings of guilt and sorrow. The hallucination breaks and Finn is revealed to be in the land of the dead, surrounded by familiar older faces, including Mr. Fox. At this point, it's clear that Finn is not just visiting, he has died, probably of natural causes. This revelation, however, doesn't deter Finn. Instead, he's excited by the prospect of reuniting with Jake, reflecting his enduring bond with his brother. This very bond with Jake invites us to reconsider the hallucination that first ushers us into Together Again. It serves as a portal into an essential facet of Finn's journey, his mental state. Given his seemingly indifferent acceptance of Jake's death as depicted in Obsidian, one might expect stoicism. But in Together Again, his guilt-ridden hallucination manifests a stark contrast, suggesting a hidden depth of emotional turmoil, likely tied to Jake's death. This hallucination, a distinct departure from Finn's usual steadfastness, exposes a profound internal struggle that had been lurking beneath the surface. Reflecting on this new perspective, it's conceivable that as time passed from Obsidian to Together Again, Finn's grief transformed, taking a darker path towards guilt. Perhaps he started to blame himself for Jake's death. This is all speculation, of course, but it seems plausible that Jake may have died in the act of protecting Finn, which is consistent with Jake's protective nature and deep love for his brother. In the immediate aftermath, Finn might have been able to rationalize it as Jake being a hero, but as the years wore on, it's likely that guilt crept in, intensifying his grief and leading to the sorrowful hallucination we see in Together Again. I'm not going to talk about the middle part of Together Again because you should really go watch it. It is so good. But I am going to be talking about the ending of Together Again. So again, spoiler warning. With that out of the way, Finn's future still awaits. Finn and Jake eventually reunite, and in the climactic moments of their journey in the land of the dead, Finn and Jake confront new death. After a conflict involving a talisman and an appearance by the Lich, the pair are in a position to potentially assume the mantle of death themselves. The intervention of Mr. Fox spares them from this fate as he manages to activate the kiss of life, eliminating new death and taking on the role himself. This climactic battle won, they parted ways with loved ones, including Joshua, Margaret, Jermaine, and Tiffany. Finn opens up to Jake about his feelings following Jake's death. Jake. When you left, I kind of freaked out. It was the worst thing to ever happen to me. But deep down, I just kept waiting for the day I'd finally see you again. Deciding to reincarnate, Finn sets off on a new journey, and after a moment of indecision, Jake decides to join him. With a final fist bump, the two find themselves together again. Their future, sure me and Beth, well, maybe. But only time will tell. Meet Baby Snaps, later known as Princess Cookie, denied, humiliated, and dismissed for embracing his differences. A dreamer with an unwavering spirit, he weathered through life's harsh realities, fueled by one profound desire, to spread joy and warmth like Princess Bubblegum. But every aspiration bears a great cost, and Princess Cookie was to pay heavily, spiraling into a tragic quest that leads him to a cliff of despair and liberation. His dream of being a princess would see a Candy Kingdom rebellion, hostage crisis, and gut-wrenching sacrifices, a tale of surreal dreams and poignant realities. This is the tragic story of Princess Cookie.
As a new arrival at the Candy Orphanage, Princess Cookie, then known as Baby Snaps, felt an acute sense of displacement. He was thrust into an unfamiliar environment, filled with faces he did not recognize and customs he did not understand, despite the harsh realities of the orphanage. His vivacious spirit often expressed itself through dance, an activity he loved and would often attempt to initiate among his fellow orphans. However, his attempts were met with the listless expressions of his new companions, their own spirits dampened by the harsh realities of their lives, their lack of enthusiasm mirroring the pervasive sadness that filled the cracked walls of the candy orphanage. It was the arrival of Princess Bubblegum that shifted the dynamic of the orphanage, and in turn, Baby Snaps' own aspirations, the whimsical tales of magic and imagination, woven with compassion and red in her soothing voice, opened up a new world for Baby Snaps, a world beyond the cracked walls and depressing undertones of the orphanage. It was a world filled with beauty, mirth, and most importantly, hope. Princess Bubblegum was at the center of this magic. Her radiant aura and captivating presence were the embodiment of the kingdom he'd only ever dreamt of. She was like a beacon in a storm, providing hope and warmth in an otherwise cold, harsh reality. Her benevolence shone brighter than any royal crown could. For Baby Snaps, she was the epitome of everything he wanted to become. Her words, Anything your sweetheart desires echoed in his mind. For the first time, he saw a world of possibilities, a world where he could transcend his circumstances. The spark within him was kindled into a flame, a flame that harbored a singular, profound desire. I want to be a princess like you. He yearned to bring the same joy, warmth, and hope to others that she had brought to him that fateful day. Fueled by this newfound aspiration, he made a brave decision. He told Princess Bubblegum about his desire to be a princess, just like her. I want to be a princess like you! <laughs> However, his bold confession was met with stifled laughter. To Princess Bubblegum, the idea of a rough and tumble baby Snaps aspiring to be a princess must have been seemed amusingly out of place. But to Baby Snaps, her laughter was a crushing blow. His earnest wish was treated like a joke, his feelings dismissed with a simple laugh. This moment marked the beginning of Baby Snaps' crisis. He was humiliated and hurt, the very woman he admired, the figure of kindness and hope he wanted to emulate had belittled his dream. She had not only laughed at him, but also at his deepest desire. This was a betrayal he couldn't accept. His admiration for her turned into resentment, and his aspiration to be a princess grew into an obsession. From that moment on, he couldn't shake off the feeling of anger and betrayal. He felt, I got dutied on as he put it. And as the resentment festered, Baby Snaps started to morph into Princess Cookie, a figure who held a profound grudge against Princess Bubblegum, believing that she just wants to hog all the princessing for herself. The one-time admiration had turned into a bitter rivalry. His wish to emulate transformed into a consuming desire to take her position. It was no longer about spreading happiness. It was about proving her wrong. Years passed at the Candy Orphanage, and as the children aged, so did their challenges. Baby Snaps, now calling himself Cookie, found himself drawn to leadership roles. He possessed a natural charisma that his peers couldn't help but be drawn towards. And as time went on, the name Baby Snaps felt increasingly disconnected from the strong, thoughtful individual he had become. The once vibrant orphanage began to show its age, and the children's spirits followed suit. Cookie grew increasingly disillusioned with the apathy that gripped his friends, saddened by their resignation to a life of hopelessness. He remembered the joy they experienced during Princess Bubblegum's visit, a beacon of hope that briefly cut through their despair. This memory became a source of inspiration for Cookie. If Princess Bubblegum, with her title and crown, could bring about such joy, then perhaps he could do the same. After all, Princess Bubblegum had once told him that he could be anything he desired. The idea of becoming a princess and spreading joy became an obsession for Cookie. The crown, to him, was a symbol of the power to change, to uplift, to inspire. It was not about rule or authority. It was about becoming a beacon of hope for the forgotten and the lost. He dreamt of creating a kingdom where everyone would be free to be whoever they wanted to be, without judgment or restriction. 
However, this idealistic dream seemed unreachable in the face of the reality Cookie was surrounded by. The confines of the Candy Orphanage became a microcosm of the larger world he saw as unjust and unkind. The laughter that Princess Bubblegum had stifled when he announced his princess dream was an echo in his mind, a constant reminder of the disbelief he had faced that day. Unable to contain his desire for change and equality, Cookie finally decided to challenge the status quo. He organized his fellow chiplets and led a rebellion against Princess Bubblegum, demanding the princess's crown as a symbol of their new world. Cookie's act was not just an act of defiance against Princess Bubblegum, but a bold proclamation of his belief in the possibility of a world where dreams aren't scoffed at, but celebrated and where everyone can be whatever they aspire to be. His rebellion, though marred with acts of hostage taking and violence, was his desperate attempt to bring about change. The crown became more than just an object. It was a symbol of hope and a beacon for those who felt lost, much like Cookie did all those years ago at the Candy Orphanage. Despite the drastic and morally questionable actions he took, Cookie's motivation remained rooted in a place of wanting to spread joy and acceptance, a desire born from the depths of his past experiences and struggles. Across the chaos of the hostage crisis, Jake, Finn, and Princess Bubblegum found themselves barricaded behind banana guards. Princess Bubblegum had attempted negotiation with Cookie. How about I give you a big cowboy hat? Then will you let the hostages go? Yet, Cookie remained resolute. Only the crown would suffice. Amid the tension, Jake proposed a daring plan. He wished to disguise himself as a mailman, a seemingly inconspicuous role that would allow him to move freely within the hostage-filled room. However, Princess Bubblegum, echoing her earlier refusal to Cookie, dismissed his idea, suggesting that he looked more like a milkman. Jake, while reluctant, agreed to her modification, and with Finn playing his shadow, the two set off on their covert operation. As Jake talked with Cookie, he found a parallel between his own small disappointment and Cookie's deeply rooted frustration. Princess Bubblegum's dismissal of Jake's initial idea echoed her refusal of Cookie's demand, and Jake began to see the struggle of the misunderstood Cookie in a new light. Cookie was labeled a criminal, but to Jake, he was a tragic figure, a victim of a harsh world that refused to see him for who he truly was. As he looked into Cookie's teary eyes, Jake saw the pain of being laughed at for wanting to be a princess, of being unable to realize a dream because it didn't conform to societal expectations. He felt a pang of empathy, a sharp contrast to the laughter and dismissive attitude Cookie had received from Princess Bubblegum. He realized then that Cookie wasn't a threat but a kindred spirit, a soul longing for acceptance and respect and a chance to live his truth. A resolve solidified within Jake, a determination to help Cookie realize his dream. Instead of seeing a a criminal to be locked away, Jake saw a fellow being that deserved a chance at happiness, just like anybody else. Cookie looked at him with wide eyes, the glimmer of hope reflecting in them for the first time. A bond formed between them, strengthened by empathy and understanding. Jake was committed to his promise ready to challenge the preconceived notions of the Candy Kingdom for the sake of his new friend, Princess Cookie. The dark silhouette of Princess Cookie and Jake astride him in the form of a stretchy horse, tore through the night. They were fleeing from the Candy Kingdom, escaping towards a freedom that shimmered in the distance like a mirage. Freedom was within their grasp. It was as palpable as the cool wind that whipped across their faces, a stark contrast to the stifling atmosphere they just escaped. For a brief moment, Princess Cookie had been able able to forget the grim reality of his existence. The laughter, exhilaration, and sheer joy of the moment felt boring, yet they resonated deep within his candy heart. They galloped on, suddenly, looming ominously in front of them was the steep cliff of a ravine. Jake didn't falter, his unwavering confidence resonated in his declaration. With a brave heart and unwavering faith in his abilities, he continued to gallop towards the edge, undeterred. Yet Princess Cookie couldn't match Jake's enthusiasm or optimism. Fear welled up inside him. His dreams, his aspirations of freedom, all seemed to dissolve into a distant echo. What ensued was a chaos of panic and desperation. Jake fell, sending Princess Cookie hurtling towards the edge of the ravine. It was a heart-stopping moment, a tangible manifestation of all the fears and uncertainty that had been looming over Princess Cookie's candy-coated heart. As Jake scampered over, the grim reality of this situation was laid bare for both of them to see. There, at the 
the edge of freedom and confinement stood Princess Cookie, teetering on the edge of despair and liberation. He knew that the pursuit of his dreams had come at a great cost, a cost he was about to pay as he looked down at the gaping maw of the ravine. His future was uncertain. He could be captured and condemned to a life in the dungeon or fall into the abyss. It was a heavy price, one that he paid willingly. He'd rather shatter into a million pieces than have his spirit broken and dreams crushed within the confines of a dungeon. And so, he let go. He let his candy body fall into the open air, an embodiment of his ultimate sacrifice for the pursuit of his dream. The sound of his fall reverberated through the canyon, echoing in the hearts of all those who bore witness. He ended up surviving the fall, but not without paying a grave physical toll. His body was shattered, his candy form broken, but his spirit, his dream of being a princess remained intact. For in his heart, Princess Cookie knew that no dungeon could ever contain his dreams. No fall could ever shatter his spirit. Despite the broken pieces of his candy shell, his dream remained unbroken. Although this wouldn't be the end of Princess Cookie's story. In fact, far from it. But I think it's better if I just let this play out. Excuse me, your highness. Jake. Special delivery from the Grass Kingdom. Princess Cookie, or Baby Snaps, as he used to be known, has spent a lifetime grappling with rejection, feelings of inadequacy, and the harsh reality of a dream that society deemed laughable. He was an outsider, a character whose ambitions dared to defy the roles defined by the society he was a part of. But his return to the hospital was not a defeat, it was a turning point. The crown didn't transform him into a princess in the traditional sense, no. Instead, it gave Princess Cookie something far more powerful powerful validation. It signified that he had finally been accepted for who he wanted to be, who he believed he was, and the recognition from his peers cemented this newfound status. His fellow inmates, once sharing the same confines under similar circumstances, now looked to him with a sense of reverence. They were no longer just patients. They were his subjects, and he, their princess. They bowed to him, not out of fear or obligation, just out of respect for his courage to embrace his truth, marking a significant shift in their perception. This moment signified more than just a change in Princess Cookie's status. It marked a change in his own self-perception. He was no longer the child laughed at for his dreams, nor the hostage taker driven by his desperation. He was a princess, the embodiment of his deepest dreams and desires, a beacon of hope to others in his situation, a symbol of defiance against a world that had once refused to accept him. So they all, Princess Cookie, his subjects, Jake, and the hospital, remain the same in essence, yet completely transformed. They had undertaken a journey of acceptance, not merely in terms of the society they were a part of, but within themselves. Their understanding of identity, ambitions, and the meanings of acceptance and respect were irreversibly changed, ushering a new era in the Candy Kingdom mental hospital, an era of acceptance, self-discovery, and the freedom to be one oneself. What if I told you that hangers were a key to unraveling a long hidden secret in Adventure Time? That secret? Patient Saint Pim. Her name alone is an icy gust of intrigue, a deep dive into a story of power, history, and yes, even hangers. She's far from a mere background character. From her escape of a cataclysmic event, teaching Princess Bubblegum the intricacies of her elemental power from a mere vapor plane, to her puzzling cameo in the Come Along With Me intro. So in today's video, I'm going to navigate the lore and mysteries surrounding Patient Saint Pim. How much of an impact this Patient St. Pim really have on the land of Ooh, and how do her actions pretty much set up all the events that take place in the finale? Just stay to the end and you'll find out. Let's dive into the chilling lore and legend of Patient St. Pim. But real quick, if you're new here or have seen my content before, please hit the subscribe button. If you enjoy Adventure Time or my content, hitting the subscribe button means a whole lot. I won't hold you any longer. Let's jump into the lore behind the mysterious Patient St. Pim. Let's rewind back to her first appearance in Season 8, Episode 8, Elemental. Picture this, the Ice King, notorious princess kidnapper, 
Shepard has shifted his interest to hangers. That's right, hangers. Odd, isn't it? They might wonder, why hangers? Why now? And just when you think things couldn't get any stranger, we see a crack glowing mysteriously in the ground. What could be in there? Let's dive in. After a series of unexpected events, a mysterious force, an intense digging session, and the discovery of an ice chamber. Do you know what this extra square footage means when I decide to sell? We are introduced to a woman who had been crafting models from the hangers inside a massive sphere of ice. And there she is, Patient St. Pin, the ice elemental, making her grand debut in the most unexpected of ways. What you think is just another wacky Adventure Time plot twist is actually the beginning of a storyline that will take us on a wild ride through elemental history and the future of Ooh. Now does that pique your interest? It certainly should. <laughs> Trust me when I say we are just scratching the surface of Patient St. Pym's story. Imagine being frozen for a millennia, waking up to find a world radically different from the one you knew. What would you do? This is the reality for Patient St. Pym, an old elemental with powers that dwarf those of our familiar friend the Ice King. When she wakes up, her first move is startling. Can you guess what it is? She demands the Ice King to lead her to the fire, candy, and slime elementals. But do you know where the slime, candy, and fire dudes are? Ice King complies, revealing that they might be the very princesses we've grown to know. Slime Princess, Princess Bubblegum, and Flame Princess. Shot, Patient forms a plan, one that Finn and Jake would fight tooth and nail to stop. But could they? Absolutely not. In a chilling display of power, she freezes our heroes in their tracks, then coerces Ice King into capturing the princesses. We're kind of like a power couple. Get me those princesses. You got it, boss. Now bear with me as we delve into her elaborate scheme. After gathering up all the princesses, Ice King returns to the Ice Kingdom and tries to free the captured princesses, but fails. Only when Patience thaws their upper bodies do they regain some freedom. Confused and shocked, they listen to Patience reveals the truth about their elemental powers, powers they never knew they possessed. Does this surprise you? I bet the princesses were probably more shocked than you are right now. Totally! But how did Patience come into this frozen existence in the first place? It's a tale as old as the world itself. For eons and millennia, there have been embodiments of the four elements. Fire, ice, candy, and slime. Patience, a previous ice elemental, foresaw a catastrophic event that would annihilate them. Her solution? Freeze themselves to survive. The others disagreed, choosing death over self-preservation. But Patience chose ice, chose survival. And all of you bit it. This brings us to a puzzling question. Did the Ice Kingdom form around the place where she sank, frozen, to the bottom of an ancient ocean? Or did her frozen form wash up on the shore of what would become the Ice Kingdom? I'm eager to hear your theories in the comments below. Now, hold on to your seats because here comes the cliffhanger. As Patience begins to demonstrate the princess's newfound powers, Bonnebel tries to turn the tables. Her plan goes awry, but a seemingly insignificant jelly bean tilts the balance. A slip, a crash, a splash of slime, and the princesses are free. Even as the episode ends, with the Ice Kingdom trying to help a trap patients, she is still revealing her grand scheme to come. Whatever. I don't need their approval. I'm gonna start some crazy biz, man. Just watch. This debut episode of Patient St. Pym sets up a storyline that promises to shake the foundations of Ooh and the series as we know it. From the get-go, it's clear Patience isn't all there in the mind, a crucial detail that will play an important role in her future. You're cool! Dialed in, you know? <laughs> what? Curious to know more? Well, let's delve into it, shall we? This whole master plan of Patient St. Pym's that I was talking about earlier is slowly revealed throughout the series. We get the first glimpse of this master plan in Season 8, Episode 19, Jelly Beans Have Power. Imagine this, PB, green-eyed with envy as she struggles to grasp her elemental power the way Slime Princess does. There's a slime and place for everything. <laughs> Isn't it just like patience to fan the flames of PB's frustrations? Just when PB's curiosity is at its peak, a paper plane flutters through her window. A direct line of communication from patience to Chadberry, one of the first candy elementals. As we take a step back and focus on PB, guided by her dreams with Chadberry, she learns how to harness her powers to maximize their potential. Isn't it fascinating how a seemingly mundane object, a paper plane, becomes the catalyst for such a powerful transformation? I did it! Chadsbury, I'm walking in my own shoes! Meanwhile, in the frosty solitude of the Ice Kingdom, Patience is bidding her time. We catch glimpses of her meticulously crafting her plan for the elementals, each move as calculated as a chess master's. What exactly is she plotting? The mystery is as enticing as it is elusive. But don't fret, dear viewers, for all that will be revealed. But Patience, like our mastermind's name suggests, is key. All we needed was a little patience. For her intricate plan takes us all the way to the series finale, Come Along With Me. Is it time for the grand revelation? Stick with me and let's find out. Remember the heartwarming moment when Finn discovers his mother? You knew my mom? You're just gonna drop that? 
That emotional epiphany propels our heroes, Finn, Jake, Bimo, and Susan, on an epic journey across three islands, in what we now know as the Islands miniseries, an odyssey that culminates in a long-awaited mother-son reunion. But hold on a minute, let's hit the pause button on this voyage and rewind back to the land of why, you ask? Because while Finn and his comrades sail the seas, who is spiraling into chaos? In the shadows, Patient St. Pym is brewing a storm, a tempest born of an elemental purification spell. I'm building a magic battery to power my elemental purification spell. Cool. Yes, that's right. The grand plan, her master stroke, is finally coming to light. But there's a catch. Patience doesn't have the power to cast this cataclysmic spell single-handedly. So, off she goes on a wild goose chase, searching for the missing piece to her power puzzle. But to no avail, or so she thinks. Enter Betty, the unsuspecting solution to Patience's predicament. Betty arrives at the Ice King's doorstep, armed with a plan to jog his memory and remind him of his past as Simon. Hey, do you want to go on a date with me tonight? Yes. Meet me at 8 o'clock at my magic man house. Alas, her plan crumbles. But from the ashes of her failed attempt arise a newfound understanding. She resolves to embrace Ice King for who he is, and it seems like Betty is finally making some progress. However, her resolve is short-lived. Her patience, recognizing Betty's untapped power, seizes the opportunity. She freezes Betty in her tracks, ushering her into her secret lair beneath the Ice Kingdom. As for Ice King, he's left scratching his head, wondering where did the weird lady go? Patience, though, distracts him with the simple pleasures of a donut. But wait, the plot thickens. Unbeknownst to the oblivious Ice King, Patience ushers in the hypnotized Princess Bubblegum, Flame Princess, and Slime Princess. As Ice King devours his tree, Patience initiates her long-planned spell, harnessing Betty's energy. When Ice King, lured by the desire for another donut, I wonder if my roomie has any more of these soothing donuts. Only one way to find out! stumbles upon the scene, Patience swiftly dismisses him. With Finn and Jake on their merry time journey and Ice King hastily banished, Patience, unopposed, finally achieves her goal, the casting of the elemental purification spell. One might think that this is the end of Patience's part in Adventure Time Saga, but dear viewers, prepare for another twist in the tale. Did I mention that Patience's elemental purification spell was a smashing success? Well, I might have been a tad too generous with the truth. You see, Patience admits the spell works too well. Instead of embracing their powers, they were overrun by them. I have distilled them into something monstrous. Imagine Ooh divided into four distinct quadrants, each ruled by a different element, a different flavor of chaos. Princess Bubblegum, for instance, morphs into a colossal gum tower. Each citizen's mind is a reflection of their quadrant's element, a map of sadness, envy, anger, or unending bliss. Now let's rewind to our intrepid trio, Finn, Jake, and Bimo. Remember their maritime journey? Their return to Ooh delivers a jolt of surprise. Whoa! What the heck happened to the treehouse? The land they knew and loved is transformed beyond recognition. Its candy visage a haunting testimony to Patience's potent spell. An unwelcome homecoming. Wouldn't you agree? But determined to understand this madness, they brave the candy tower of Princess Bubblegum. But the journey is fraught with danger, and Ice King must pull them to safety before Bubblegum can convert them into candy. Not to be deterred, our heroes set their sights on the Ice Quadrant, Patience's icy abode. Their mission? To rescue Betty, the missing puzzle piece in Patience's spell. And rescue my new pal, Weird Lady. As they tread the frosty pass of the ice domain, they meet Carol, once a cloud person, now an ice statue. But Carol snitches. Carol! Once they confront Patience, she expresses regret, but offers no assistance. Narrowly escaping becoming a resident of the Ice Kingdom, our trio, along with the frozen Betty, manage to escape. Their journey is a wild ride through the quadrants, each step a brush with transformation. With a thawed Betty and the collected crown jewels, they hope to cast a counter spell. But Betty, as we know, has other plans. Meanwhile, Patience witnesses her kingdom melt under the growing influence of Princess Bubblegum's expanding candy empire. Watching her frosty domain dissolve, she takes the final step. She freezes herself again, hoping to wake up in a better world a thousand years later. Mr. Fox, please roll me someplace safe. And if you're not familiar with Adventure Time, and you're wondering if Ooh ever returns to its former glory, it does. Thanks to LSP's anti-elemental powers, Finn and LSP activate these powers, effectively restoring Ooh to its original state. So, all is good. And now, surely this time is the last time we see Patience St. Pym in the Adventure Time series, right? Wrong. 
What do you mean I'm wrong? She appears again? Oh my goodness. Yes, she appears again, and not many people seem to notice it, but she actually appears in the new Come Along With Me intro. Did you see her? Let me play it one more time, this time in slow motion. Right there. She succeeded yet again in freezing herself for another thousand years. Now, spoilers here for the finale, but if it weren't for Patient St. Pym, the events that took place in the finale would have never happened. Not only did Patience contribute to the start of the Great Gum Conflict by casting her elemental purification spell, which led to Finn and LSP using LSP's anti-elemental powers to reverse the spell, which ultimately caused the effects of the Dum Dum Juice from 800 years ago prior to reverse as well, which started the whole conflict between PB and her family again to the start of the Great Gum Conflict, but also the arrival of Golb too. Betty honestly seemed to be heading down the right path after realizing that she will probably never get her Simon back and starting to accept the Ice King for who he is. But something changed when she was frozen and used for her power by patience. Her ultimate plan to reverse the spell was not to reverse the spell at all, but time travel back in time to stop Simon from ever wearing the crown. We know that this plan eventually failed thanks to Ice King and she's teleported to Mars to try and cure her obsession for the Ice King and the madness put on her by Magic Man, which leads to her ultimately learning nothing from that entire episode and devising a plan to finally save Simon from the crown and get Margles back for Kingman, which leads us directly into the finale when they succeed in summoning Gold. If it weren't for Patient St. Pym or any of the actions that she took, none of this would have happened. She is directly responsible for pretty much everything that goes down in the finale, and she even makes a one second appearance in the intro. Classic Patience. As we uncover more about Patience, we see a whirlwind of strategy, manipulation, and pure survival instinct. With all her vivacity and eccentricity, there's a calculating brain hidden behind the blizzards. See any similarities between her and Urgence Evergreen, you know, the ice elemental millions of years ago? Two characters bound by a formidable will to survive despite impending disaster. Coincidence? Or is there more to the frosty story? It's interesting to note their individual paths. Evergreen, racing against time to confront the Catalyst Comet, versus Patience, choosing to freeze herself to evade the Mushroom. Conflict, the irony in their names isn't lost on us. Urgence, signifying urgency against time, and Patience, an embodiment of enduring patience. But let's not brush off the tragic undertone to Patience's character. She wakes up to a world that is alien compared to what she knew, distorting it further with her elemental purification spell. Yet her victory feels empty. Power without the world she loved? Is it worth it? Witnessing Patience's transformation is like watching an ice sculpture melt. Once vibrant and electric, she grows quieter, her once methodical plan spiraling. Her icy kingdom melts away before the advancing candy empire princess bubblegum, leaving Patience in a deep chill of despair. And then comes a significant moment. Patience freezes herself yet again, hoping to wake up to a better world a thousand years later. It's a bleak testimony to her intense loneliness and disillusionment. The jovial, lively character we first met is now a lonely figure, choosing isolation over a world that has moved on. Haven't fed your lore craving hunger? Still want to learn and uncover more mysteries about Adventure Time? Well, do I have the perfect thing for you? Watch this video where I uncover all the mysteries and lore surrounding the Mother Gum. From its start to middle to end, I reveal it all. And what I uncover is truly amazing. You won't want to miss it. But if you found this video intriguing, hit that like button. And not subscribed yet? Please consider. It's a massive boost for the channel. But as always, my friends, stay adventurous. Ah, the moon looks so nice. Look how friendly she looks. Okay, a little weird, but surely that's just nothing, right? Okay, I was wrong. This is the moon, and her story is filled with mystique and lore. The moon is a vampire like Marceline, and is a part of the Vampire King's court. You know, that one guy. Yeah, that guy. It's chill. The moon's story is filled with things that are so weird and so hard to understand. But that's why in this video, I'm going to tell her story, then reveal all the lore and mysteries surrounding the moon, while trying my very best to explain each and every little detail about her character. But first, if you're new here, or just like Adventure Time, please subscribe. It means so much to me, but without further ado, let's get into the video. The moon's introduction to the series is short but sweet. We see her, along with the entire Vampire King's court, form from the vampire extract that PB did to Marceline. She's even playing the flute here. How sweet. However, things would only get more strange and weird from here on out. That's her voice! After the Vampire King's court realize they are back after getting KO'd by Marceline, they each go their separate ways. Instead of making a scene about it, the moon silently retreats towards the lake, dropping moon pearls as she leaves. Surely this is an aside of all the weird things that come with the moon, right? Right? After Marceline learns that all the vampires are back out in the land of Ooh again, 
This is really bad. She makes it her mission to stop them all, just like she did all those years ago. However, while fighting the Hierophant, she gets slashed by him, and therefore poisoned by him. She falls ill, almost lifeless, but PB remembers that the moon has self-healing abilities, so she sends Finn and Jake to look for her. When she says, You guys stake her back to the poison lab. It sounds like you guys stake her back. Surely this won't come up later in the episode, right? But PB, Marceline, and Pep Butt go to Pep Butt's poison lab back at the Candy Kingdom. This is where things start to get really weird. Cut to the forest. Finn finds a moon pearl. Jake says it's gross, but Finn thinks they're pretty. Gross. I think they're pretty. They follow the trail of moon pearls. It leads to the moon's hiding spot in a boat. They find the moon sleeping in a vase. Jake, very scared, tries to stake the moon. They wait while Jake thinks about the moon exploding or something, as it should for staking a vampire. And then the stake sword comes right out of the moon's body. She just healed that sword right out of her bod. The two are very surprised the moon didn't explode into dust after staking her, but they wouldn't give up. The two try frying the vampire in the sun. It works, but the moon heals her face nearly as fast as it burns. While Jake thinks of a new way to kill her, Finn tries staking her a bunch of different ways. Like what Bonnabelle said. Wait. You guys stake her back to the poison lab. Also, keep in mind, the moon just stays sleeping the entire time this is going on. Not a care in the world. It's almost like she knows that they can't hurt her. Wait, hold on. But at this point, Finn and Jake have been staking the moon for hours. Yes, literally hours. Man, we've been doing this for hours. Finn says that it's weird that Bonnie wanted them to stake her back, rather than taking her back. When the two finally think about it, they're still confused between you guys stake her back and you guys take her back. Finn just suggests that they do both. Jake says that they should put her back in the vase as the sun goes down. When the thing on her forehead wiggles, Jake panics and puts the moon back in her vase to sleep. But she wakes up and hisses at them. Finn being the daring hero that he is, dares her to chase them. Come get his blood bucket! What? Run! So, she does. Finn rides on Jake's back, and the moon chases them. Now, this is where things start to get even more weird. The moon keeps chasing Finn and Jake. When Jake asks why Finn made her chase them, Finn says that Marcy needs her healing, which she does. She is slowly dying by the second. Finn sees the moon running with many feet, and very fast. But he mentions that she's smiling right at him. She's smiling right at me. I don't need the play-by-play, -play, man! She's messing with us. Finn realizes that the moon is messing with them. She's not catching up to them on purpose, even though she very well could. Finn asks Jake to stop so we can talk to her. Jake, however, is way too scared to slow down, as you should, but a good slap in the rear makes Jake slow down. Finn starts saying some tough words to the moon. Then she starts to speak in a deep voice. You run in the path of my light. How can you lead me? When I am your guy. Finn notices that she's talking about the real moon in the sky. Then, the moon starts laughing with a horrific expression which causes Finn to get scared and Jake to run faster. <laughs> Me no like! Run, Jake, run! But back at the Candy Kingdom, Marceline has to wait two whole hours before Pet Butt's antidote kicks in. While talking about ways to pass the time, Jake busts through the wall, with Finn and the moon close behind. Bonnie hides with Marcy in a hatch and locks it, telling Finn and Jake to hold her off until Marcy wakes up. They realize that the moon isn't trying to attack them, just standing there. So, Finn uses his prime opportunity to attack. However, when Finn tries to stab her, he suddenly collapses. The moon hisses at Jake and he also collapses. Finn tries to stop her by grabbing her ankle, but just gets pulled along. Finn even asks the banana guards to help, but she melts the chocolate covering their tops. The moon is after Marceline and tries to open the hatch that PB and Marceline are in. However, it's locked. The moon tries to pick the lock by just screaming hit Open, pigs. Open, pigs. while Finn goes back for his sword Bonnie slaps Marcy lightly and tells her to please wake up Marceline wakes up to the moon picking the lock and opening the hatch yes just by screaming pig did you just yell pigs at the lock until it opened out of nowhere, Pep Butt shoves a giant stake in the moon from behind and shoves it forward. Marcy sucks the moon inside her and heals quickly, falling asleep peacefully in Bonnie's arms. Let's start with the biggest question. What is the moon? Now, if you remember back to the start of the video, I said that she was a vampire, which is true. But there are definitely a lot more deeper and more hidden meanings behind what the moon actually is. The moon from Adventure Time is not just a vampire, but a symbol of mystery, delusion, and confusion. Her very existence ties into the moon tarot card 
card, which represents fear, anxiety, subconscious, and bewilderment. Feelings and conditions she inflicts upon people around her. Now, if you're familiar with the Adventure Time series, you would know that tarot cards have been brought up before. Jake's daughter, Charlie, is a skilled tarot card reader and has an understanding of how to read the future and see a person's essential nature through mystic rituals. But back to the moon. The moon's mysterious powers include accelerated self-healing, which makes her almost invincible, and creating glowing pearls, which seem to serve as a deliberate trail for others to follow. This connection to pearls further ties into the moon's traditional symbolism, as pearls have long been associated with lunar beauty and mystery. Her peculiar dialogue and actions cause fear and disorientation in those who interact with her. Even when she's asleep, her presence seems to discombobulate those in her vicinity, leading to miscommunications and misunderstandings. Like, Finn and Jake literally tried staking her for hours, making zero progress every time. This could be seen as a passive defense mechanism on her part, making it even harder for anyone trying to harm or kill her, as seen by Finn and Jake. Moreover, the moon's character is filled with dualities. This is reflected in the classic moon tarot card's depiction of a dog and a wolf, symbolizing the civilized and the wild. The moon embodies this duality with her seemingly tame persona that can quickly shift into a feral state. For example, remember the very intro to this video? She starts off seeming like a nice and calm character, seen by just playing her flute along with her vampire pals. Even as she sleeps in the vase, she seems pretty calm and doesn't appear that threatening. Heck, even when she first starts chasing Finn and Jake, she's just running with a grin on her face, purposely not catching up to them. But remember, that was at first. All these moments show off her calm and tame persona, but can still quickly transition to a feral and scary state, as we can see when she talks to Finn and when she tries to kill Marceline. The moon represents the mysterious depths of the subconscious and hidden realities that are yet to be understood, which is best shown by the fever dreams Marceline has throughout the episode, where the moon takes the main stage. What do these dreams really mean? And do they reveal anything about the moon or even Marceline? Marceline's fever dreams are very telling of her subconscious, fears, desires, and her relationship with others around her. Let me explain. In the first dream, Marceline is knocking on the door of a home where Simon and Betty are making a pot. She arrives, looking fancy and holding flowers. This dream seems to illustrate Marceline's longing for normalcy, familiar warmth, and love, a stark contrast to her vampire hunter life. We even see in flashbacks the human's initial resentment against Marceline. And I mean, even Simon. All these relationship Marceline makes eventually just crumbles away from her. Her affection for Simon is well known, as she regards him as a father figure from her early post-apocalyptic days. The fact that she brings flowers might signify a desire for reconciliation or to express unspoken feelings. In the second dream, the scenery changes drastically. Marceline is older, singing a sad song. Peppa is digging a grave, and Bonnie, Princess Bubblegum, is taller. This could represent Marceline's fear of death, aging, and isolation, which are common themes throughout Adventure Time. The fact that Marceline appears a lot older, but PB doesn't, might represent the fear that Marceline has about not being a vampire anymore. After all, her being a vampire is the only reason she is able to live for so long, and without that, she has to grow old while watching those around her not age at all. <clears throat> Bonnie. Marceline's inability to hear might symbolize a communication barrier between her and Bonnie, but as the dream progresses, it starts raining inside the cabin, and a hand pops out of Bonnie's mouth. This could signify a fear of being swallowed by her problems, or perhaps internalized fears about Bonnie not being able to help her with the challenges she's facing. Then, the cabin shakes, and orange ooze starts dripping down the walls, revealing the full moon, likely symbolizing the moon's influence and Marceline's fear regarding her. The presence of the moon in Marceline's dream signals its intrusive and powerful influence over Marceline. This could be symbolic of Marceline's own subconscious fears and anxieties, as possibly unaddressed trauma regarding her past encounters with the vampires. The moon's voice is heard as Marceline wakes up to the moon opening the hatch. This could reflect the blurring of lines between her subconscious fears and the reality of her current predicament, emphasizing the urgent threat that the moon presents. Marceline's dreams hints at her internal struggles, deep-seated fears, and unexpressed desires. They demonstrate the impact of the moon on her psyche, underlying the mysterious, unnerving power that the moon possesses. This ties in with the overall theme of the moon as a symbol of subconscious fears and unknown realities, as her presence in Marceline's dreams triggers the surfacing of these hidden emotions and fears. It's a complex, nuanced relationship that showcases the depth of Marceline's character and the fascinating symbolism imbued in the moon's character. Finally, let's answer one more question, and perhaps the most mysterious one, and the one that you might not have even known about. Remember back to the very first time we see the moon? It's when the Vampire King's Court has a big dispute and each member goes off on their own way. The Hierophant shapeshifts into a warthog and leaves towards another forest, which ends up being where the Hierophant bites the dust. Literally, the Empress says that she will build her own army and leaves towards the Ice King 
kingdom, which ends up being the place where she buys the dust. However, the moon silently retreats towards the lake, dropping moon pearls as she leaves. And if you remember, Finn and Jake find her at this lake, but she isn't killed there, unlike the other two vampires. It's not until she arrives at the Candy Kingdom, trying to get Marceline, where she finally bites the dust. Why wasn't the moon killed at the place she retreated to, like every other vampire did? Well, the answer is that her motivations are less rooted in the quest for power or control, and more aligned with observation and existence, as evidenced by her primary ability being healing. This passive orientation might be why she didn't face the same fate as the other vampires at the place she retreated to. Furthermore, her enigmatic utterance could offer additional insight. This statement might imply a subtle guiding role, suggesting her influence on the paths of other characters like Ben and Jake. Traditionally, the moon is seen as a source of guidance and light amidst darkness, perhaps aligning with her role in the narrative. Thus, she might not directly confront her destiny, but instead indirectly steer others towards the outcomes she anticipates, which could explain why she wasn't eliminated at her retreat like the others. There's also the possibility that the moon intentionally allowed Marceline to defeat her. Her final dialogue with Finn might reflect an acceptance of an inevitable end. As an entity embodying mystery in the subconscious, she might have had a profound subconscious awareness of her impending demise. Given her shared vampiric origins with Marceline, she might have felt a sense of connection that led her to accept her end in a different location and at Marceline's hands. As for why she would allow Marceline to absorb her, several theories can be suggested while still aligning with the question of her different fate. The moon might have sensed her impending end and chose to face it on her own terms, diverging from the other vampires. Her shared history and vampiric nature with Marceline might have fostered a deeper empathy, prompting her to decide her own end. She might also have felt alienated in the world of Ooh and believed that her powers could be better harnessed by Mars, thereby choosing a different ending for herself. But like everything related to the moon in Adventure Time, these are only interpretations. The beauty of this character is her cryptic nature and how she fuels a continuous sense of intrigue and wonder in viewers' minds. As much as we can try to dissect and understand her, there will always be an element of her character just shrouded in mystery, just like the real moon that shines in our sky. And that's the mysterious story behind the moon from Adventure Time. But just like the moon, there's another character with a captivating and enigmatic aura, someone who has equally baffled fans and stirred endless debates. And that's none other than Patient St. Pym. Ready to venture further into the intriguing mysteries of Adventure Time? Let's uncover together the enigma that is Patient St. Pym. We'll unravel her origins, discover her deepest secrets, and decipher the lore that surrounds her. I guarantee that by the end, your perspective on Adventure Time will be utterly transformed. So, why wait? Click on this video to start this fascinating journey right now. But as always, my friends, stay adventurous.